Good morning, everybody. If I could have your attention before uh, we start to serve lunch. I want to thank everyone for coming. Just a couple updates on the police department. Um, we, up on our social media page, you'll see we're having uh, Public Safety Day, May 14th. We're going to have a child seat installation service. So if you're in need of a child seat and you have a hardship, uh, we wrote a grant. Um, we'll provide that free of charge. We'll also install it for you. If you, uh, you want us to check your grandkids' child seats or, or child seats from a family member, uh, come down to the high school 10 to 3, uh, and we'll properly inspect it and make sure it's uh, securely fastened. We're going to have canine demonstrations. We're going to have District 7 from the fire department. It's a region, like their regional SWAT team. They're going to be there to give some demonstrations. The Sheriff's Department will be there with their command vehicle. Uh, Worcester Emergency Management will be there with their communications vehicle. Environmental Police will be there. The State Police will be there with the Identikit, uh, the thumb drives for fingerprints and different things uh, for missing children. Uh, we'll also have New Hope there, uh, domestic violence. Uh, Parents for a Safe Graduation will be there. Uh, the Central Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council SWAT team will be there. Um, with their armored vehicle, uh, as well as other local law enforcement agencies, as I stated before, to include this, the state police. Uh, the Army National Guard is also going to attend, and they'll have equipment there. So we're hoping this is going to be an all-inclusive public safety day. Uh, there'll be s uh, basically groups there, uh, and it's all free of charge. So uh, hopefully you can attend. Also, just to announce, um, especially those at home watching on cable, uh, being rebroadcast, re uh, and you'll see more of this at the next selectmen's meeting, we applied for a grant, a private grant from Walmart, um, and we were awarded $2,000. And that grant's going to allow us, we're going to uh, hold two um, citizens police academies. And we're going to do two because we want to keep the class sizes smaller to have more uh, hands-on. So you'll have uh, classes by our detective, our canine officer, grant writer, a lot of things that you've seen here but more hands-on. We'll go to the range. Uh, we'll certify everyone in CPR. Um, and all those things. And this $2,000 grant will allow us to purchase some equipment and supplies uh, to run this so it's not coming out of the operating budget. So I'm very thankful to Walmart. Um, myself and Officer Morissette uh, gave a presentation this morning uh, down at their store. Uh, they had a staff meeting uh, thanking them, so we're very appreciative of that. Again, to remind everybody, the prescription drop-off receptacles in the lobby of the station. Again, we just, uh, I don't have the wait for you, but we just, um, we just uh, emptied it again. Um, Basically, it, it seems to fill uh, every three weeks, so we're real pleased with that, uh, and we'll keep uh, you informed of any uh, opiate task force uh, issues that are coming up. We're going to be uh, implementing some things in the near future. So um, we, we have today with us uh, the Massachusetts Senior Medicare Patrol Program, and they're going to present to you, uh, I think it's going to be a very informative topic. Again, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here. I know uh, the weather's been a little trying. I guess we may be getting some snow this weekend. I could tell you yesterday we were out straight with this wind, um, all the trees down. So everyone just be careful out there. And again, anyone has any questions, any issues, any topics that you'd like to see from your police department, please contact me, Masha, or my assistant, Gene Daly. We'd be happy to put that on for you. And again, uh, you guys have a great weekend and stay safe. And last but not least, remember, special town meeting is tomorrow. Uh, it's a very important vote. It's dealing with a sewer treatment plant and a potential power, a sewer project rather, upgrade in a power plant. Whether you're for it, whether you're against it, your voice should be heard. Uh, they're going to actually do this. Um, it's going to be just basically a private vote, like when you do an election, uh, which I think is a good thing from my standpoint. We talked about this at a department head meeting this week. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, I voted a certain way at a town meeting as a resident, and someone said, I'll never vote for another police department initiative again because I voted the opposite way they did. So my personal vote shouldn't affect the police department. I'm a resident. I'm entitled to my vote, as you're all entitled to your vote, whether you want a power plant or you don't want a power plant. And the other is, I can tell you, walking out, I saw two couples arguing because the husband was upset with the way the wife voted. So this saves marriages, too. So uh, I, I think this is a good thing, and I'm hoping, Uxbridge, uh, this becomes a trend because I think people should be able to vote their conscience, not afraid what their neighbor thinks or, or what their friend thinks. I think we all need to be, vote how we feel, and it's very important that you all attend uh, if you can make it, uh, transportation can be provided, et cetera. But these are very big initiatives that impact all of you, uh, all of us as residents. And I'm very proud to say I'm a resident here. 
uh, and I hope to see you all tomorrow. Uh, it starts at 9 o'clock at the high school, and I'm done. Yes. Oh, okay, I'm not done. I lied. All right. I, I, well, there was no intent to deceive, so I didn't lie. Um, next Tuesday, the 5th, Tuesday, the 5th, uh, the police department, uh, the association, and myself are going to come down, and we're going to serve all of you lunch uh, on our expense to say thank you uh, for your support for the police department. So that'll be Tuesday. It's going to be a spaghetti luncheon, um, and this was an initiative brought forward by Officer Zizinski. So if you haven't met him yet or haven't seen him in a while, he'll be here. Uh, and I'm very proud uh, of all my staff for all the hard work they do and their commitment to the community. So I'll see you Tuesday um, with them. Yes. Now I'm done. Yes. Thank you, Chief. Okay, our van has arrived, so we'll just take a brief moment so our people can come in and get seated, and then we will serve you lunch. And we have... Kelsey Crawley here today from the Senior Medicare Patrol. It's a very interesting and important topic. You have a lot of good handouts in front of you that gives you a brief understanding of what Senior Medicare is all about. So um, we'll just take a moment to welcome all our friends. Come on in. Again, I just want to take a moment to welcome all of you here to our beautiful Fish Friday luncheon. I want to thank Lynn and all of our volunteers for putting this nice luncheon together for us. And I also want to welcome Kelsey Crawley. She's here from the Massachusetts Senior Medicare Patrol Program, otherwise known as SMP. And she's going to talk to us today about the cost and consequences of health care errors, fraud, and abuse. So I welcome you, and I thank you so much for coming out to talk to us about this important uh, issue. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As she said, my name is Kelsey. Um, I'm from the Massachusetts Senior Medicare Patrol Program. Before I get started, I just want you all to know I talk very fast. I'm from the New York area, so if I'm talking too fast, feel free to slow me down. Raise your hand, do whatever you have to. Um, and if you can't hear me as well, feel free to stop me at any time. Um, I really want this to be an interactive session. If you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me. If you have anything that you want to add to it, um, feel free at any time just to raise your hand or get my attention so I know that you have something to say. Um, and so the Massachusetts Senior Medicare Patrol Program, there's three of us. There's myself, Caroline Cole, and she's in charge of event coordination as well as the volunteers. And then we have Lucelia Prates, who's the director of the program. And um, the Massachusetts Senior Medicare Patrol Program's mission is to help all of you, um, your family members and your friends, to become engaged healthcare consumers to help prevent healthcare errors, fraud, and abuse. So we are a federally, fun federally funded program and um, we have an SMP program all over the United States as well as Guam, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and DC. Does anyone want to tell me which flag represents which place? Anyone? OK. So we have Puerto Rico. You have um, Washington, DC, which is the white and red with the stars. And then you have Guam and the Virgin Islands. And how we get, um, we're actually a statewide program, like I said. So we're everywhere. We're actually located in Lawrence. My office is in Lawrence. Um, but we go everywhere in Massachusetts. And the way that we're able to do that is through our volunteers. Without them, we would not be able to reach um, Eastern, East Massachusetts, West Massachusetts, South Massachusetts. And my director is currently in New Bedford right now. So it just goes to show that we need our volunteers um, to actually do what we do and to spread our message. Um, normally, a volunteer would even be delivering this message to you, which they do a great job doing. So I just wanted to emphasize on the fact that our volunteers really are the backbone of our program. Our program's language capacity, um, the Massachusetts MAS, the SMP program can serve 11 different languages, um, Native Americans and in rural co um, communities. These are all the languages that we can um, speak to people in. We have somebody that speaks 
um, Spanish. Lucilia, who is our program director, she speaks Portuguese. And we also have um, certain certain um, personal health care journals in those languages. So if you know anyone who speaks only Russian, we have a personal health care journal in Russian for them as well. And we also, the MISMP program is a statewide program, as I've stated before. We, had a, we have a vi an advisory council, and the advisory council meets um, four times a year, twice over the phone and two in person. And it's very important for us to have these meetings because they allow us to brainstorm and to get other ideas from people in different um, organizations and programs. And they really bring forth um, great benefits to us because AARP recently sent out an email blast to all of um, the people at AARP and it was an email blast recruiting volunteers for us and we were actually able to get 19 new volunteers from the email blast that took place in December. So that email blast goes out like I said once a year and it's very important because it helps us to get more volunteers, which eventually helps us spread our message. And then we also have Levanta, which is another very important organization, not to take away from any of the organizations here because they all help us out tremendously, but Levanta is quality um, of care organization and what they do is if you were in the hospital and something were to happen to you and you felt as though you were treated improperly or something happened with the quality of your health, you would contact them and they would be able to help you. And then we also have Safeguard Services, which is contractor of CMS. And we have um, the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office, which um, is part of the triad there. And they actually, Joseph Canavan, he actually just accepted his offer to serve on our advisory committee. We really want to start reaching out to the triads and we want to have them be more active with us so that way we can help you guys. And we also work in partnership with AAAs, ARP, like I said, ASAPs, um, Elder Services, where we're located out of, is an ASAP, obviously. And we have we work with COAs and, like I said, Triad. So here's all, all the people that we partner with. And there's a couple more. So I have a question for all of you. Approximately how much money do you think is lost each year due to healthcare errors, fraud, and abuse? Millions, thousands, anyone want to shout out numbers? Millions. Millions? Billions? Okay. So whoever shouted out billions was right. It's actually um, 60 to $90 billion a year that we lose, all of us lose, because we're all paying taxes, so it's our tax dollars that we're losing. 60 to $90 billion a year in healthcare errors, fraud, and abuse. And throughout my presentation, I'll explain to you exactly how we're losing it, because it's in multiple ways. It's not just one way um, that we're losing this money, but it's very important for each and every one of you to become engaged, to make sure that you're keeping um, documents of your health visits and as, as well as comparing them with your Medicare summary notice. Um, but it's an overwhelming number and it's also, if you think about it, it's a little bit more because this is as of 2014. So it's only increased since then. And here are some more important statistics. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid cover nearly one out of three Americans. So Medicare um, and Medicaid, they cover a lot of you. And I don't know how many in here are actually Medicare and Medicaid um, beneficiaries, but it helps a lot of you. It helps um, my, you know, my grandparents, it helps them, it helps my dad. So um, it's very important. And that's why we wanna make sure that we're keeping that money for people that actually, you know, we need it. And more than 100 million Americans um, are covered by Medicare and Medicaid. And Medicare and Medicaid or Medicare enrollment actually started in 19, it was, the bill was passed in 1965, but in, by 1966, 19 million people were enrolled. Think about 19 million people, that's a lot of people. And in 2014, it was reported that 54 million people were covered. And when I think of that, I can't even grasp how large that is, 54 million people. Um, but I can think that it's a lot of people that are going to be affected by this. And by, 2000, by, two by 2030, it's predicted that 81 million will be enrolled in Medicare. 
So 81 million is, I mean, that's even more than 54 million, which I can't seem to grasp. And here's a couple of um, did you knows. So these are important. Medicare fee for service programs receives receives and processes over 3.3 million claims a day. That's over 38 claims per second. So that's a lot of claims per day. Just the fact that it's 3.3 million, there's not enough time in the day to process those claims. And also Medicare program alone pays out over 1.5 billion benefits. Um, benefit payments per day and answers about 75 million inquiries annually. So now I want to go into the important part, the reason why all of you are here. You want to know about fraud and abuse and errors and how it's wasting away. So what is fraud? Can anyone tell me what they think fraud is or how they would define it without looking? Anyone? So fraud might be when someone's calling your house at 7 o'clock in the morning and asking you if your wrist hurts or if your back hurts and how they can help you. And when you get those phone calls, you need to hang up. Okay. The other day, I live with my grandparents. I help take care of them. And the other day, someone called at 7 in the morning from Miami, Florida. And I said, Miami, Florida, 7 in the morning. We don't have relatives there. And they said, well, does your back hurt? My grandpa said, yeah, my back hurts a little bit. And I l allowed him to have the conversation because I didn't want him to think that I was eavesdropping or that I didn't want him to feel like I was smarter than him and trying to take over the conversation. But then he said, well, oh, and what about your wife? I can send her something too. The only prescription you should be taking from to anywhere to get your back brace or your neck brace is from your doctor. You don't want to take it from somebody that's over the phone. Uh, there's a lot of companies online that will say, oh, we'll get you a neck or a, bra a back brace. And that neck or back brace may cost $20,000. This is inflated, but let's say $2,000 for that. When normally you could go to Walmart and get it yourself for $5, $10. So you want to make sure that you're really hanging up the phone when people are calling. And that's my example of fraud. Um, but fraud is intentionally and deliberately doing something. It's knowing that what you're doing is wrong and knowing that you're going to make a profit from it. So what we have written down here is that fraud is intentional, intentional deception and intentional misrepresentation, which is an example I just gave you. Um, what are errors and abuse? For me, an error is, say if you went to the doctor and um, you got a bill and it wasn't from the date that you went. Maybe by mistake your doctor um, miswrote down your number and wrote down somebody else's, so you got a bill for Mary and your name's Anne. That's an error. That's a mistake that can be fixed. That wasn't intentional. They weren't trying to bill you for somebody else's services, and it can easily be fixed, which is what we believe at the um, MASMP program. We believe that Everything is an error at first. We don't want to look at it as everything is fraud. We like to believe that this world is a little bit better. So we try to believe that it's an error until, it's, until they've given us reason to believe that it's fraud and they're doing it intentionally. Um, and then for me, abuse borderlines error and fraud because if it's becoming abusive and you're noticing that you know, you're putting in the wrong code every single time, it's not it's not that much of an uh, of an abuse anymore. It's now fraud because you're doing it willingly. So um, we have here, such procedures may result in receiving payment for services that fail to meet professionally recognized standards or care or are medically unnecessary or, in, or incur charges, unnecessary charges. So like I said, um, if it was a mistake and it was an unnecessary charge that you received. So here, um, in your packets that we gave out to you, you should have Rita's story. I encourage all of you to read this story. It's a great story about how our program helped her. Rita is a wonderful woman who went through um, issues with her durable medical equipment. And this story really breaks down how we stepped in to help her. Um, she, long story short, she had a chair that she wasn't using um, and someone stepped in and they, they noticed that she wasn't using her chair and we were able to help her 
get another chair. But you should really read the story because it's a great read. It's not something that you should just throw out. I encourage you all to read it. I'm going to give you my own example of a case that I worked on because I know it best. I actually just started with the program six months ago, um, but I've worked on a lot of cases and you'd be surprised how many people call in with very different scenarios. Everything's different. So here's an example. This is, this is what I think, um, the consumer that I dealt with, what the chair she was given. It may not have looked like that, but it worked just like that. She was given a chair, and I want to give you guys a story because this can happen to any of you. And if it has happened to you, we encourage you to call us. But she was given a chair, and Medicare dished out, I want to say, $27,000. $27,000 is a lot of money. And if I'm paying $27,000 for a powered wheelchair, it better work like a Cadillac. So she got her new wheelchair, and about a month after she received it, it stopped working. It was not working correctly. It was dying on her. It was making noises. So she contacted um, the vendor like she should have. She knew to contact them. And when she contacted them, they said, oh, we'll send somebody out. They came out and looked at it, and they gave her new batteries for her wheelchair. About two months later, after her wheelchair was still not working correctly, she gave way with it. She stopped using it as much, and she needed it to get to doctor's visits. So she called them again. They came out and looked at it, and they replaced the motor in it. About five months later, she called back and had another problem with it. They decided to replace all electrical components in the chair. So now we've moved into her having this chair for about eight months, and it's still not working the way that it should have originally worked, especially if it's a new chair that Medicare is paying for. So after that, she contacted them again and said, this wheelchair is not what I want. It's not working correctly. I paid a lot of money for this. And she didn't pay anything out of pocket for it. But that's when the charges started coming of them saying, well, you have to pay for this and this and this and this when she shouldn't have been charged for it because the chair wasn't working in the, in the first place. And I refer to this chair as a lemon chair. All of you know what a lemon car is? There may not be a lemon wheelchair, but in my mind, there is. In my world, there's lemon wheelchairs out there. And that's exactly what this is. And it was unfair to her because she didn't, she didn't know where to go or where to turn to. And I can't exactly remember how she got to our program, but I was glad that she did. Um, and she contacted us a year after the, the wheelchair was not working constant problems. So once she contacted us, um, the last straw with the wheelchair was they fixed everything. They had replaced the base of the chair. They replaced all electrical components. They had put new batteries in it. They had done everything they could to salvage this brand new chair. So she finally contacts us and says, I don't know what to do. This chair is not working. It's making funny noises. And then we step in and we contact the vendor. The vendor promises to give her a new wheelchair. At this point, they said they tried everything that they could and that she, wasn't, she, was, um, she deserved a new wheelchair. So that's what they were going to give her. So she calls me, which was the highlight of this story was that she thought to call us. She picked up the phone and said, Kelsey... And luckily, I was by my phone because I'm always running around crazy. She said, Kelsey, I have the vendor here, and they want to deliver my wheelchair, but it doesn't look new. Should I take it? And I said, absolutely not. I'm going to contact the vendor now. When I contacted the vendor, they said to me, well, the wheelchair, it was in a new box when we received it. I can get new shoes. I can get old shoes in a new box. And when we, t when we contacted the vendor, they informed us that it was a demo chair, so people were trying it trying it out to see if they like it. And they were going to give her a chair that people were using to try. So I said, absolutely not. The fact that she's even gone through this over the past year, she should have never went through this when Medicare paid for it. She needs to be reimbursed or she needs to have a new wheelchair. So what she did, what they did was they gave her a new wheelchair. She's now a very happy customer. And they retracted all of the bills that they originally had charged her for it, for the new batteries, for to place replace the base. They retracted all of that because they realized she shouldn't have to pay for something that didn't work in the first place. And that's why, um, oh, and here's her new wheelchair. This is my cool new thing that I've done here. And that's her happy new wheelchair. <laughs> um, so that was just an example of how 
uh, being an engaged healthcare consumer can really save you. If she would have never picked up the phone to call us, I'm scared that she would have had thousands of dollars to pay for the new battery, the electrical components in the chair. So it's really important to make sure that you're documenting every time you visit a doctor or any healthcare provider. Ooh, I want to go back to that one. And then we also have home health fraud, which is another important thing. Um, this is, some of these are predominantly for people that are homebound, um, and they may not relate to you, or they could. But performing skilled nursing and home health aid services in a single visit, falsely documenting, documenting re records to reflect two separate visits, and billing for two visits. So that's something that we can't do. Billing for skilled and unskilled nursing care that was provided by home health care worker. And then billing for services provided to beneficiaries who do not meet the homebound definition because Medicare has a very specific definition of homebound. Um, and we want to make sure that people are actually homebound when they're collecting all of these services. And then billing for skilled nursing or therapy services when housekeeping, homemaker, home chore, or custodial services were provided. So now we're going to go into a little bit more of Medicare, and I don't want to talk too much about it because it's very complicated. And if any of you have gone to your Shine counselor, you'll know that uh, speaking with somebody who knows Medicare very well, and none of us know it to the T because it's constantly changing, but I'll only speak to it just enough that you can understand it. Um, but Medicare is very complicated, and that's why we, we make it a little bit of a puzzle. Medicare C is a little bit different than A, B, and D, so that's why it's off to the side. So part A is your inpatient admissions, your home health care, your hospice, and your skilled nursing facility. And then you have part B, which covers your outpatients and your, con your consults. Um, so that's while you're in the hospital, if a specialist comes into you, if you have a dermatologist come visit you while you're in there, your part B will cover that. And then we also encourage you, if you notice here, it says see Medicare Part B chart and Medicare and U 20, 2016. How many of you know where your Medicare and U book is? How many what? No. Know where your Medicare and U book is. You've all received them. I wish everyone's hand was raised because they're very important. Um, and we, we encourage everyone to read them. And if you don't know where it is, even speaking with your Shine counselor, they may have extras. I know at our office we have a bunch. Um, and then we also have the Medigap supplement, which covers the 20% that um, your Part A and B don't cover. And then you have your Part C, which is your Medicare Advantage. And some of them, most of them have your prescription coverage. And then your Part D to me is very important. All of them are important, but your Part D because it's your prescription coverage. You want to make sure that you're getting your best um, bang for your buck, if you would say. You want to make sure that you're getting uh, your prescriptions at the lowest price possible. And then I, I'll give you some important reminders, which is to carry cards only when you need them. Don't ca you wouldn't carry your social security card around. I hope that no one's carrying their secure social security card around. Um, but you want to treat your Medicare card the same way you would your credit card because um, your Medicare card obviously has your social security number on it. Usually it'll have your social security number with A or B or whatever is next to it. But you really want to treat it like it's a credit card. You want to be careful with it. And so what we say here is to only carry your Medicare card with you when you're going to the doctors, if you're going to the hospital or the pharmacy. And you want to protect it, like I said, protect all of your cards, your Social Security, um, and your credit cards. As well as your Medicare and uh, Mass Health and other insurance cards as well. So that brings me to uh, my next most important thing. For me, the personal health care journal is so important. Each and every single one of you have a little red journal. And if you don't like the journal, feel free to go out and purchase your own. It could be pink, purple, zebra, whatever you like. And just make sure that you're following the same pattern that's in our personal health care journal because it has a lot of things that you need. It has it wants you to write down all of your prescriptions. It wants you to write down every single time you go to the doctors, what was done to you, the date. Um, and then in the back of it, it has five important questions for each and every single one of you to ask your doctor. Those five questions are crucial. 
you know, when you go to the doctor, you need to go there and be prepared. Go to the doctor and have questions for him. Ask, do a little bit of research to find out what they're saying you have and say, do I need this to be done? How much is it going to cost if it is done? And will my insurance company cover it? And when you ask that question, I also encourage everyone to ask themselves that. Ask yourself, will my insurance com cover company this? And if they won't, you need to think about your plans. You need to go see your shine counselor and ask them questions as to what will help you get the maximum coverage that you need from your insurance company. Um, but in this, we say important reminders, keep an updated list of your medications. Prepare for medical appointments, like I said. Carry your journal even when you're traveling because something could happen when you're out of the state or out of the country. And then always compare them. When you get your Medicare summary notice, you want to compare that to your personal health care journal because that's how you notice when fraud's taking place. That's how you notice an error. That's how you notice um, something that's abusive is if you're comparing them and noticing, I didn't go to Dr. So-and-so on this day, but I'm being charged or Medicare is being charged $500 for it. And the reason why we say it's so important, I won't get too in-depth with this, um, but these are so important because Medicare will not pay for hospital-acquired conditions. So anything that happens to you while you're in the doctor's office or while you're in the hospital because of the hospital, the hospital is responsible for paying for it. And that's why you really need to make sure that you know when you went to the hospital, did you have a staph infection? No, you didn't. You acquired it there, and Medicare won't pay for it. Um, and some, sometimes they do wind up paying for it because we don't realize that it happened to us because of the hospital. So these are some of the things that can happen in the hospital that uh, Medicare is not going to pay for. If you have a foreign object, and I won't give that story because it's a little bit of a long story, but I'll give you a brief um, a little brief synopsis of it. So we had a woman who came to us and who had a five inch wire that was left in her for three years. She was in excruciating pain, excruciating pain. And she was just putting ointment on it because she didn't know what to do with it. And she had called the doctor's office so many times and complained to them about this excruciating pain that she had. And so she went to the bathroom one day and she went to change the bandage because it looked like a little pimple underneath her ribs. And she saw two inches of the wire protruding out of her. She didn't want to go to her doctor's office because he hadn't been listening to her about the pain that she was receiving or the pain that she was feeling. So she went to urgent care and they took out five inches of wire from her that, were, that was left in her from her open heart surgery. And the worst part about it was that this was two years after. So think about her quality of life for two years that could have easily been fixed. She was in pain. She couldn't bend down to tie her shoes. Imagine trying to play with a little child and not being able to bend down and play with them because you're in pain. So the reason why we ask all of you to be so engaged and so, um, and so, what's the word I'm looking for? involved in your health care is because things like this can happen to any of us and she knew that this was from her surgery she went to the doctor and said after five months she said I'm in pain and the doctor said it's because you're older it takes you longer to heal so if to not add you know salt to the injury she was told that it was just because she was older it was taking more time for her to heal when really this wire had been in her for three years, 2011 to 2013, I'm sorry, two years. So any, any of these things, Medicare won't cover. And the reason why I bring up that story is because she went to the doctors on multiple occasions, and that's thousands of dollars that Medicare was paying for something they should have never been paying for. So now we have to go back and try to chase those dollars that are missing because it's important. You know, if the doctor did something wrong, they're responsible for making those those payments and they're responsible for retracting whatever they sent out and they're responsible for fixing whatever mistake they made. So here's a couple of them, just a head injury, a burn, electrical shock. Um, and I shouldn't say just because these are serious things. And then here's a continuation, which is um, a few things, surgery on the wrong body part, which we actually, I went on the radio two weeks ago and I actually had somebody say, my brother had his the wrong leg um, removed. And I said, yeah, that's another thing the hospital should be paying for. But I won't get into that. Hopefully it did. And here's another story that I have for you guys. And I really want to share it because it touches home. Um, the program director, Lucilia Prates, this is her father. 
and um, the story is very sad, but it ties everything in together. And I ask that all of you pay attention because it's a very important story. So I'm just going to play it. Hopefully my link works. I'm trying to be computer savvy now. There we go. Our father went to a prominent healthcare institution in the Boston area to remove stones from his left kidney by means of a commonly performed procedure. Less than seven months later, our father died, a victim of a preventable hospital-acquired infection. During this procedure, our father contracted a staph infection, which required him to be readmitted to the hospital repeatedly. This marked the beginning of the most horrific six months of his life. A staph infection is defined as outside bacteria and organisms invading the body causing disease. Hospital acquired staph infections are spread through healthcare workers, medical instruments, and hospital surfaces. The staph infection resulted in the removal of his left kidney. When we questioned the urologist about the dangers of removing the highly infected kidney, he confidently dismissed all of our concerns. Our father hesitantly agreed to have the surgery to remove his kidney. He came home hoping that the worst was over. Both the surgeon and his primary care physician consistently dismissed our father's physical symptoms even though he often exclaimed, I feel terrible. I feel like I'm going to die. Several weeks later, our father was rushed to the emergency room for rectal bleeding. He bled profusely, losing more than eight units of blood in a matter of minutes. It appeared as though he would not make it through the night. He was admitted to the medical ICU, where it was determined that the infected kidney stump had not been removed, causing the bleeding of his aorta and colon. In other words, our father was not only a victim of a hospital-acquired infection, but also a medical adverse event. The next morning, he underwent emergency surgery to repair his colon and aortic artery. Upon his discharge, he tried to resume life, but life was never the same. Although we felt optimistic that the worst was over, our father continued to feel sick and would often tell his doctors, you guys did this to me. He felt that he was at the mercy of the doctors and a disconnected healthcare system that had failed him. During a follow-up visit with his vascular surgeon, our worst fears were realized. The emergency surgery had not been effective and the infection continued to ravage his body. His only hope would be to undergo two additional bypass surgeries. During this ordeal, I silently vowed to my father that his suffering would not be in vain. It has become my mission to educate consumers to take an active role in their health care. Our father became a victim of a fragmented health care system that can only change by engaging consumers and having them understand that they have a voice and it should be heard. We need to have a groundswelling interest from consumers in order to change the health care structure that exists today. Perhaps we need public outrage. Enough is enough. 100,000 lives are lost each year to hospital acquired infections in the United States. This is the equivalent of a daily plane crash and all of its 273 passengers dying. I ask you, what would the FAA do and what would the public reaction be? We need not only expect, but also demand quality health care for our loved ones and ourselves. We all need to work together to bring about change so that future generations will benefit from a reformed health care system. So that was a story, like I said, that was our program director's father. And what she says every time she tells the story, or every time the story is played, is that think about all the money that was spent while he was sick, that Medicare paid for um, all of his visits. And that was something that happened to him while he was in the hospital, and this can happen to anyone. So we encourage all of you to be engaged healthcare consumers and 
Lucilia always says that quality of um, the quality that you receive when you're in the hospital is also very, very important because, again, it equals the money that um, is being spent. And then also just to slide into something a little bit off topic, but um, still important as well, is this gaining access sheet that we have here. This gaining access sheet all of you have, and this has a list of phone numbers that are incredibly um, important for each and every single one of you. On the back of it, there is, I um, believe it's Other Medications Association or Assistance Program. There's a couple of phone numbers on here that can really help you out. Levanta, like I said, very important. But um, one of them on here actually tells you if your medicines are um, working together. So you just want to make sure that you know that because I know some of you see multiple doctors and sometimes they don't really know that you're taking this or if this is working with that. So it's important to know that. Lucilia, our program director, always says if you're taking more than five medications a day, make sure you give this phone number a call and just to see if there's anything that they can do for you or to try to um, limit the amount of medications that you're taking. I know my grandma was taking 11 in the morning and Lucilia looked at me and said, Kelsey, 11 medications when she wakes up, that's way too many. And we actually went to the doctor and they lessened it and now she's only taking, I want to say, about five or six in the morning. So, And then I also have important reminders for you. Like I said, make sure prescriptions are paid for by your Part D. So always reach out to your Shine counselor um, to see what works best for you. And if it's not covered by your insurance company, your um, consumers, which is you guys, should explore the following options. These options down here... Um, are also in the Levanta, it's kind of cut off, but it's also in the, um, not the Levanta, also in the gaining access sheet. And so um, there's the exception form, limited income subsidy, which is through Social Security, uh, state prescription assistance program, MA College of Pharmacy and Health Sur Sciences, pharmacy outreach program, and then needy meds. So those are all um, very important things to know. And this one's my favorite. Um, like I said, check for, check for restric restrictions on your Part D. Always make sure the medication belongs to you when you go to pick it up because they can make mistakes or that it's to the person that you were picking it up for. And then always count the pills in the bottle. Sometimes they could have ran out and given you 23 when you were supposed to get 28. So always make sure that you're counting them. I know I'm a trusting person. Sometimes I don't feel like counting the 70 pills that are in the bottle, but it's important to do that because you're paying for it. And so steps to address healthcare errors, fraud, and abuse. If you feel like um, this program or this message that I just provided to you has sparked something in your mind and you said, well, hey, last week I went to the doctor and I was charged for something that I never received, here's what you do. You give us a phone call, and that's our number there. It's also on the back of the personal healthcare journals. It's even on the pens. So one day, um, if you have a friend, give the pen to the friend and maybe they might give us a call. Um, there's also our website, which we're actually working on updating right now. And so it'll be more user friendly and it's going to have lots of cool things on it. And then we also have the resource center. That's for anyone that's out of the state. So if you have any friends that live in Virginia, they have an SMP there. They have a senior Medicare patrol program there too. And you just want to give them that link or that phone number so that way they can receive the same help that all of you can receive. And then the shine, which like I've been saying shine, 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 because it's so important. Um, I don't know. We're not SMP, um, are, we're not Medicare specialists. We don't know everything about it. And shine does. They go through vigorous trainings to make sure that they understand what they're talking about. And um, Lisa Rose at Elder Services, where we work from, she's amazing. She knows a bundle of information that I can't even comprehend. So it's very important. Do you have a question? What is Shine? Shine is a program that helps you understand um, your Medicare. So they'll explain to you your... Understand it. Yeah, so they'll explain to you your Part A, your Part B. They'll explain to you Medigap. They'll explain pretty much everything to you. And I think, Marsha, are you, do you know if there is a Shine one here? There isn't, right? There's a shine, there is isn't not one, an official Shine person here. But over the years, I've acquired a lot of information, and I work very closely with Tri-Valley and with Shine. So exactly. I can help you get started if we get stumped. Mm -hmm. There is a Shine representative at Tri River now. Yes. So, and I have the telephone number for Shine in Milford at the Milford Senior Center. 
Because we're having I'm having problems with my bills. So yes. Okay. We have three insurances, and they're you know they're all over the place. It's, it's very yeah exactly what Marsha just. It's so confusing. I was on the phone for three hours yesterday, and of I. Course. We always say that if you want to spend your day at home, you can contact your insurance company because the wait time for some of them, for some of them is very long. Um, but that's why the shine counselors are so important. And usually if there's not one in your town, like she said, there's one that's nearby. And if you have a means for transportation to get over there, it's so important. I'm still trying to get my dad. I'm like, dad, go. You need to go see your shine counselor because they have them in every state also. Um, so it's it's truly important to make sure that you understand your health insurance because even I, I got a bill and I was like, $600? All I did was go to the doctors because I didn't select the right coverage. And it was my fault for just, you know, when I started working, I just selected anything. I didn't fully understand that each of them cover different things and what exactly they cover and who's in network and who's not. Um, and then we, $7,000 is a lot. So if that's not fraud or abuse and it's just the wrong select. It can impact your credit score. So yes, please, if you have any questions. I, in home Massachusetts, home? actually, I'm not 100% sure. Correct me if I am wrong. I believe in Massachusetts, it cannot affect your credit. Doesn't affect. I was happy to know that because you can make the least amount payment. I believe it's, um, I could be wrong with this too, but it could be $10. You can send them once a month or um, however they have their bill set up. You can send them, you can send them the, the minimum payment of like $10 because it shows that you're making an effort for them to not send it to collections. Yeah, but you can pay zero and they, they can't. Exactly. Even if you pay zero, it won't affect your credit. But it's, the, the, it's going back and forth. You know? Yes. Yeah. Nice so I tell everyone, like you, don't pay your bills unless you understand what you're being charged for. Exactly. So it's easier for us to help you out if you didn't pay it. Because if you didn't pay it, then there's room for me to go in there and try to talk with the um, doctor's office and get everyone on the same page for them to say, all right, you know what? We've had enough. We're not going to charge her. But if you've already paid it, it's hard for us to say, hey, can you retract that, what you sent to Medicare, and resubmit a new one? Because for them, it's more work. So it's easier for us to just say, retract it. So. Um, then we also have Medicare. You can you can contact Medicare, and they'll refer you to us. And you have a question? Yes, this is a quick one. Mm -hmm. If you have health insurance, yes, and there's a copay, <coughs> yes, of ten dollars, mm -hmm. and your doctor accepts that insurance, yes, should you expect to get a bill from him after you paid the ten dollars and left the office? I've seen that happen, and that has happened to me before. Is it ethical? I'm not sure. It just depends on what you have. So I, because I don't know the bill and what you were charged for, or if your insurance company, because you could have a ten dollar copay, but if you discuss something else, they could have charged you for something else that you weren't covered for under your insurance. Yeah, exactly. So they could have charged her for something else. It gets really complicated, yeah. and everyone's case is different. Yeah. So yes. that's why it's yeah. so important to let some one of us know. And each day, I learn something new. We all learn something new every each day, day because each case prevents, uh, you know, presents a new set of, that, of problems mm -hmm. and questions. So please come to us. And, and I'm sure Marsha will be happy to help you with any questions. Please let us know. And we also have a lot of informational people coming in from Mass College of Pharmacy um, to talk to you about your Part D during open enrollment. We have a lot of yes. Reps coming. Open enrollment for all of you is October 15th through December 7th. So that's when you can enroll in your Medicare. Um, in your parts A, part B, and see what works best for you. And during that time, Shine is incredibly busy because people want to know what works best for them, and that's why we encourage everyone. We work in partnership with them so closely because they refer cases to us and say, hey, this happened, and is this normal, or is this, you know? So we work with them because they know so much about Medicare, and then they can send stuff to us that doesn't sound right. Um, but Medicare will also refer you to us if you contact them, which is new, and Inspector General Hotline. So if you have anything that has happened to you and you want to voice it, you need to call the Inspector General's Hotline. No, but help me, Mom.
Good. Yes, there's a lot of and um, my other important reminders, again, you always want to review your Medicare summary notices. It says this is not a bill. So most people wind up throwing it out. I know if I read something that said this is not a bill, I'd be like, I don't need it. But that's so important because even though it might not be costing you, like I said, out of pocket, um, it can cost Medicare tons of dollars, millions, billions, which is why we're here, which is why we've been paid by uh, federally funded to be here because clearly there is a significant amount of fraud, errors, and abuse that takes place. And so you want to review your Medicare summary notices, your explanation of benefits, you want to review your bills and receipts, and you want to compare them. You want to compare all of this with your personal health care journal. And if if you are not getting these documents, you need to find out why. You can go online for your Medicare summary notices, and it's not, it's, you have to sign up for it. So we say, just call Medicare and ask them to send you your um, quarterly MSNs, which you should be receiving. Um, but you don't have to go online if you don't want to. And then word of caution, like I just said before, don't pay the bill. If you don't, we're not telling you not to pay your bills because when you have bills, you have to pay them. But if you didn't receive the services or if it doesn't make sense to you or if in your gut you just feel like something's not sitting right with you, it just doesn't feel right and you can't remember them ever doing what they said they did, don't pay the bill. Give us a call and we'll try to figure it out for you. We'll research your case. Um, it'll actually go to me <laughs> or Lucilia and um, we'll get down to the bottom of it and see, all right, Sorry, Sue, you were responsible for that. We researched it, and this did happen. Um, you signed this and that. Or, hey, they just said that they're going to give you back the $300 that you paid. Well, you shouldn't have paid because I said not to pay. So, um, Or we're going to take off that $300 bill that you, you owe us. So that's always important. Like it says here, compare your summary notices to your personal health care journal. Medicare will not call or visit to solicit or sell products, plans, or anything else. So like I said before, when you get those phone calls at 7 a.m., it's because they know that you're home. Or if they call you at 3 in the afternoon. I had someone call last night at 9 o'clock for my grandfather. And I said, no legitimate business is going to be calling me at 9.30 at night. Will we find most people at home at 9.30? No. Because I'm 23 years old, but I'm in bed by 9 o'clock. So I don't think that's an appropriate time to be calling. And then also, like I said before, if it doesn't sound right, um, if it doesn't feel right, then give us a call and we can check it out for you. And even if it turns out that you are responsible for it, at least you know that you checked it out and you're not like, did I just pay $400 for that and I didn't want to? So just make sure that you reach out to us. And then I also want to let you all know, now that you've heard this message, every single one of you are responsible for paying attention to your personal paying attention to your personal health care journal, comparing it to your Medicare summary notices, and letting us know if something doesn't feel right, if you were billed for something that you didn't receive, it's your responsibility now to tell your friends, you know, to help each other out and say, hey, I went to the doctor and this just doesn't feel right. You know what? Give us a call because I don't mind. I'll talk to you all day long if it means that we can get down to the bottom of where this bill came from and why you're being billed for it. Okay. So I just want all of you guys to know, like I said, just encourage each other to review your Medicare summary notices and review your bills because there will be a day one day that it comes down to you and you're being charged directly and it's not just Medicare and you're going to wonder why you have to pay it. Um, do any of you guys have any questions for me? Don't be scared. Don't be shy. I will not bite. No? No questions? You have a question? <laughs> I'm trying. I belong to the VA medical program. Mm -hmm. I go to the clinic in Worcester. They have an entire staff of primary physicians that are not licensed to practice medicine in, in Massachusetts. As a result of that, they are not allowing those doctors to write prescriptions to local pharmacies, which would save tons of money. Yeah. For example, let's say aspirin. Mm -hmm. They are charging 140% more by forcing us to go to the VA pharmacy because the doctors aren't licensed. What can be done about that? I haven't heard that before. Um, but if it has to do with the VA, have you talked to a higher up in the VA? Because I know for veterans, um, 
you guys not saying that you're entitled to more than, but you know, you guys deserve what you're entitled to and you served our country and you know, so I would suggest, um, I can talk to Lucilia about this, um, because I haven't had a question where it has to do with the VA. Um, but I would definitely try to speak to a higher up and if they're not, um, receiving your message, even maybe the inspector general's office, I'm not sure if maybe they could be of help, but, um, that is a great question. I don't have a direct answer for it. I can look into it for you. Um, but that is unfortunate. You know, it, that should definitely not be the case. And I haven't heard that before, but 104% more for aspirin, 140. Yeah. So I would try to speak to a higher up. And if that doesn't work, um, we definitely do have to look into that because I haven't heard that one before. In fact, my primary care physician on a one-on-one -on -one conversation actually broke down and wrote me new script for a single medication, generic, very cheap. And she asked me not to say anything to the staff because the policy there was so tight against doing that. Because of, yeah, because they're not supposed to. In my to. opinion, the illegal things that they're doing at that point. Yeah, so if they're doing illegal things at that, is it, where is this place located? Lincoln Street, Worcester. Okay. VA clinic, there's only one. Okay. So in that case, if it's, if it's the VA doing it directly and they're the ones being manipulative and facetious, then I would definitely, there's got to be some place that's not Worcester. There's got to be a VA, a higher up that's not in Worcester that can definitely help you out because that doesn't sound very ethical to me. Yeah. So I would contact, I would contact, like she just said, the head honchos because when you bring that to them, that allows them to be investigated or them to be researched as to, is this just his complaint or are there multiple? For all you know, they could be under investigation now, but I would really contact somebody that's higher up just to find out what's going on with that because that doesn't sound normal. It's far from normal. Recently, from Oregon, Portland, mm -hmm. Oregon, and I got all my uh, generic drugs yeah, they're even at Target now, too, I believe. Mm -hmm. Because it saves a ton of money. It does. And on a fixed income, the difference, 140% difference is significant. Yeah, it is. I know that even Walmart, Target, they're supposed to be carrying it. The VA now, Target, I think, is now, like, the go-to. It's supposed to have all of the, it's supposed to accept it and have all of the medication readily available. So that's interesting. Does anyone else have any questions? You might call it fat man. <laughs> yeah, you could even call the senator, someone just said, which is a good idea. Yeah. So I want to thank all of you for your participation and for listening to me um, throughout this presentation. This was my first presentation. I didn't want to say it till the end. So I just wanted you all to know that. If you could tell, I'm sorry. But thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you all listening. I think Kelsey did a great job for her first presentation. So yes, let's give her a nice round of applause. Thank you for coming to Oxbridge and with this very, very important information. And so if you want to follow up with this, please hold the date, May 20th. We will be launching our first uh, SMP um, Beneficiary Council here right after lunch at 1 o'clock. OK. And I'll be quick when I say this. If you bring stuff to the table, if, if I've, anything I've said to you today has um, caused you to think about something and you maybe want to review it, if you bring that with you, one of our volunteers will be more than happy to sit with you. And that's what we want this to be. We want this to be very interactive and we want all of you to come to us with your stuff and say, can you look at this? Can you look at that? And we'll have no problem doing that. We actually enjoy that. The researching part of it for me and for the volunteers is the fun part, which is why they volunteer to do these programs um, and to do the Beneficiary Council. So bring whatever you have with you. Okay. Thank you all so much. Have a great weekend, and thank you for coming. I hope you found this informational.